Thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, great to see you all. Uh, being in quick meetings is always a pleasure uh, for all of us. But before I start, I would like to thank Eva and John for bring all their efforts for bringing us together. Uh, this year, uh, as we all know, we are meeting under very extraordinary circumstances. But thanks to technology, we still create opportunities to exchange ideas and meet. And this year, the topic of my presentation is the psychopolitical impact of uh, pandemic uh, on global politics. Uh, it is a theme that I'm still working on uh, in my draft article. And in the presentation, I will also try to uh, give, refer very briefly to three researches that we have done as Skudar University. Then I will try to touch very briefly the strategies that the governments are using or abusing uh, nowadays in this era of uh, pandemic. Uh, I will try to get into the subject uh, from the gate that Sunday has already opened us for us. Let me start to my presentation with this. And slides, slides. Yes, I'm trying to use the technology as much as I can. So I think you can see my slide. Is it? Okay. Uh, you know, we're always uh, thinking uh, very um, optimistically. We're trying to do that uh, for the future. And uh, while we're uh, trying to create some future prospects and happily uh, prospects for the future, we always think in a very, uh, let me do, uh, thank you, very, uh, mm, very concrete uh, ways. And also when we get into the 21st century, uh, our thoughts were very optimistic. Uh, however, uh, although we, with, uh, we began to the century with the Un United Nations Millennium Summit's declaration, uh, which was declared in September 2000, uh, we were talking about eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, achieving universal primary education, promoting gender equality, empowering women and these kind of things, and also developing uh, a global partnership for development. Uh, these were the main ideals. However, the first global crisis of the millennium broke out in 2001 with the massive terrorist attack. And with that terrorist attack in 9-11, uh, it was a day of unprecedented shock and suffering uh, created by a series of Al-Qaeda attacks which killed thousands of innocents, caused massive destruction and had an adverse economic impact in the global scale. And the second global crisis of the century was the great economic recession that occurred between 2007 and 2009. And the economic crash, which was triggered by a combination of speculative activity in the Western financial markets, markets um, focusing particularly on property transaction, uh, metamorphosed to the greatest disaster of the global economic system uh, the world has ever witnessed since 1929. Uh, although uh, the epicenter of the collapse was United States at the beginning, eventually the impact spread around the world to both advanced and developing economies in a very short period of time. So, and the path to global recovery was rocked and the damage compelled the governments to adopt their policies to the new dynamics of global economy, which hardly fits with the liberal st strategies that became traditional uh, after 19, 1989, the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And the third global crisis of the 21st century started with the shocking footage uh, from the city of Wuhan in China. And the, in December, uh, 31st of December, Chinese authorities notified uh, Wu of an outbreak of a new disease, which was named uh, after named COVID-19. Uh, although at the beginning it was believed to remain a local problem, it, it is soon understood that uh, this new disease is the most serious health crisis the world is uh, facing since the Spanish flu in 1918. COVID-19 spread all across the world despite all measures uh, and by March 11, 
who had to announce the global outbreak of a pandemic. Contrary to what was hoped uh, in the Millennium Summit, the 21st century came with global political, economic, humanitarian and health crisis. The first global crisis radically changed our perception of security. And the second, our confidence in liberal capitalist values and market economy. And the third seems to change how we live, work and relate to each other. Um, and definitely as a sum, the economic, social, political and humanitarian cost of the pandemic can be considered as the worst of all. But all these three crises uh, consolidated the power in the hands of the nation states. Uh, even it, it, we, cons we call it a global village, a nation state arose again uh, from its wreckage. Uh, one of the most important outputs of the pandemic is the spreading psychology uh, for sure, and uh, which also contributes to the spirit of time, the, the political spirit of time. Uh, psychological factors plays an important role in how people cope with the threat of infection and associated losses. And also they're important for understanding and managing societal problems associated with pandemics, such as spreading excessive fear, anxiety, loneliness, uh, stigmatization, xenophobia that occur when people are threatened with uh, an enemy, with an infection. And it also has an effect on belief systems, interpersonal relations, interfamily relations, state citizen relations, and also state to state relations. As President Macron defines it, it is a war against an invisible enemy uh, and the enemy is everywhere. Even uh, our loved ones, our kids, grandkids can easily become a reason of our deaths. So touching, kissing, hugging, suddenly become, can become uh, poisons, dangerous poisons for our lives. So we, we have started distancing ourselves from each other. We lost trust to each other, to the state, to our institutions. We lost joy, we lost hope for the future. Uh, and it's unfortunately, it's like being isolated in the middle of an ocean on a small boat for just only one person. <clears throat> so during this COVID times, we as Uskida University conducted three researches. Before extending the discussion to global politics, I would like to share with you some hints about uh, our uh, researchers. Uh, we are now um, several, we are facing with several surveys and uh, we have made uh, at least 10 surveys in our university. And there are lots of other universities who are doing con conducting researches and surveys. Uh, we are trying to find out the different phases of uh, the pandemics and the, its consequences from economy to social life, from feasibility of online education to health work workers satisfaction level. We are trying to find, understand the impact of this novel coronavirus. And uh, it, we, we have understand that it also have a great impact upon the political preferences of the public and creates great pressure on governmental mechanisms. People ask for protection, healthcare, economic support, compassion from their leaders, and they always complain. Uh, according to our uh, coronaphobia uh, research, um, uh, we have done it uh, with our political psychologists and the center and our psychiatry uh, groups. Uh, it, this, this research was done in April, uh, one month after the first corona case was diagnosed in Turkey. And the aim of this map of coronaphobia research was to understand the psychological atmosphere of the country. This research involved 6,318 people in 81 provinces. And we have tried to find out the level of fear and anxiety in the society caused by the pandemics. The basic finding is despite all the fears and concerns, the majority of the participants were not hopeless or pessimistic at the beginning. Interestingly, uh, the cities who do not for, vote for the ruling uh, AKP party uh, had more fear, uh, and also the, in the Kurdish majority sides had more fear, but in the southeastern part of Turkey where HDP, uh, the Kurdish political party is powerful, uh, they are like the pro-AKP uh, citizens of Turkey. So. Uh, 
people are very politicized uh, in here and they, they are receiving lots of uh, refugees, but uh, compared to some other regions, they don't have that much fear. Um, sorry. And we asked another uh, question about anxiety. It gave, gave us a, a similar map actually, and the future concerns were the uncertainty of the process, 50% uh, of the people thought in that way, the absence of uh, social relationships, uh, people, uh, create, this creates anxiety, and 41% of the people uh, underlines this issue, and anxiety of accessing to healthcare, 31% uh, of the people were thinking in that ma uh, manner. According to the data, 52% of, of the residents of metropolitan cities were worried about watching news and following social media. And this rate was 47% for those living in towns and small cities. This shows us that if the people trust their government or if they trust their party leader, uh, if they think that their leader may give them a shelter that will protect them from dangers, this feeling of trust helps them to cope with their fears. But if they don't, they have more reasons to fear from all kinds of dangers, not only pandemics. We made another survey, uh, our health department did this, uh, we, but it was done in, on July, and this told us a very different story because the anxiety level jumped to uh, 78%. It was a web-based research conducted on 1,298 people, and uh, the main uh, issue is people told us that 39% uh, of the people told us that they lost the joy of life. And 34% uh, uh, feels that they are fearful and panicked. 48% feel uh, insecure. 57% uh, are very anxious about losing their relatives and their, especially the elderly people in their families. And 47% is watching uh, very anxiously the spreading of the disease and 45% uh, said they were concerned about whether medical facilities were prepared. And by late July, we, our sociology department made another research, again, uh, with, for, with uh, 3,000 people over the age of 18. Uh, we found out that there's a difference between the feelings at the beginning and after four months. Uh, coronaphobia research was about psychologies of the people. However, this, was, uh, this one was about lifestyles. And the new data showed us that people started to get more nervous every day and started losing their trust to uh, the government. Basic findings were uh, sleeping, eating, and drinking habits have changed similar to the other parts of the world. Uh, to give you an example in this, uh, we learned that from other surveys, of course, 86% uh, of the Chinese people uh, changed their eating habits and more food is eaten at home. Uh, the change was 77% uh, in Hong Kong and 62% in Malaysia. Uh, the same case um, is visible in the United States. 83% uh, of the Americans told that they have started cooking more at home and the time spent with the family increased. And in parallel to this, unfortunately, domestic violence uh, has increased everywhere. So these three researchers showed us that COVID-19 has already penetrated in our daily lives, businesses, and perceptions. So it's not surprising to see how it starts to influence uh, the global politics. COVID-19 uh, is also, it's also used in uh, daily political relations, abused in daily political relations. Uh, I'm, um, I use the subtitle as propaganda tool, uh, yes, it is the COVID wars and it became a pro propaganda tool for all the countries, all the nation states. Uh, although we're talking about multilateralism, nobody, nobody wants to come to a global umbrella. Uh, everybody wants to create its national agenda and everybody wants to come a step forward. As uh, Ulrich Beck warned us in the 1980s, uh, we're living in a risk society and politics is everywhere. So we're not dealing with just a medical problem since the risk is complex, its political reflection uh, is complex too. Uh, and the question is whether the nation states or politicians or societies want to cooperate against this threat. When there's a common enemy, will it promote cooperative actions or provoke self-help mechanisms? 
Um, are we, are governments willing to organize themselves for helping the world's 7.5 billion inhabitants? Or are we ready to share the good and the bad together? Are we ready to share the vaccine, for example? Uh, it seems that our planet is not a global village anymore. We're living in a world with walls, with borders, with distinctions. So COVID does not seem to bring us together, instead tearing us apart in terms of politics. The states, all the states are uh, using these kind of um, tools. They want to put the blame on the other. They use stigmatizing, sta scapegoating, accusations, asking compensations and uh, these kind of things. They, they have to find uh, someone or some centers to blame. And also they use we won strategy. Uh, they are very ambitious to fight with the uh, disease and they started declaring that we, we defeated the virus. It is uh, our power, it is our culture, and these kind of things. Also, uh, uh, under the leadership of China, they are using the politics of generosity uh, in order to show their kind and good face. Uh, they are very generous in helping other countries, but there are political reasons behind. And the vaccine rage, there's great jealousy, there's a huge rivalry, and they, th this is a, a race of hero, heroism, you know, in every uh, uh, pandemic scenario in Hollywood, uh, there is going to be a hero and it's going to rescue the whole world. So everybody wants uh, to be the uh, uh, handsome guy who is going to uh, help the whole world. And also artificially created success stories uh, while playing with the statistics and recovery mechanisms are very important nowadays. Uh, let's talk about putting the blame. There are several conspiracy theories. It's not only um, uh, in the hands of the nation states. There are non-governmental actors and social media trolls using these kind of conspiracy theories. And this COVID crisis has given rise to an enormous amount of deliberate misinformation about the crisis, its origins and its eventual consequences. Um, as you know, conspiracy theories identify the enemy, usually a secret plot a group of conspirators uh, that threatens people's lives or beliefs uh, while spreading mistrust in public institutions, uh, which can also lead to po political apathy or radicalization. Uh, they also spread mistrust in scientific and medical institutions. And let me remind you who's warning about the outbreak of infodemics. The story is like, there's no such thing uh, as coronavirus or the virus is a biological weapon developed by the United States or by China or by Israel or by uh, Zionists or anybody or by the uh, space uh, crafts. Or the virus is produced by Bill Gates Foundation and he already produced the vaccine. Uh, he'll make billions from this pandemic. Depending on who you are talking to, the, story, the stories point out different scapegoats. In some countries, conspiracy theorists have gone so far as to attack mobile phone towers with the blame that the COVID-19 virus is spread by 5G. And uh, also there are accusations coming from the governments. According to Trump, for example, China and the WHO are the ones who carry the responsibility of the whole pandemic. He repeatedly named the virus as China virus or Wuhan virus and prepared for demanding compensation from the Chinese government. Uh, the rumors are saying that uh, it's going to be $1.3 trillion. In Pompeo's words, uh, he thinks in the same way, Americans are still wearing masks and watching the pandemic's body count rise because Chinese Communist Party failed in, the, in its promises to the world. And on the other hand, some Chinese officials uh, claims that uh, it's very widely uh, uh, accepted in the uh, Chinese community, by the way. Coronavirus was introduced to China when 300 US soldiers arrived at Wuhan for the military world games in mid-October. So it is very easy to put the blame on some other. And this one, we won't uh, strategy. Uh, this picture is from the ceremony uh, during which President Xi Jinping uh, presented the highest national medals of the recipients. The doctors were awarded uh, the Medal of the Republic and the national honorary title for their outstanding contributions to the country's fight against the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, the big fight against coronavirus with more than 1.4 billion people involved has made China to declare the first uh, country that they defeated virus. I, if it is true or false, I, I'm not sure, but it's it doesn't seem very normal to be.
according and in order to show their superiority in fighting with the disease chinese uh, news i'm sorry chinese news outlets used words like uh, purgatory and apocalypse to describe the tragic hospital schemes in south europe they have run photos of british and american medical workers uh, wearing garbage bags as protective gear and according to Xi, it is Chinese culture and system who defeated the virus. And it is the Western culture who couldn't cope with a small virus, for sure. And according to them, the era of Western domination is ended, and this pandemic marked the start of the Asian century. Another politics uh, strategy, I can say, is the politics of generosity. China takes this public health crisis as an opportunity of the century for them to cement its place as a global power. While providing medical assistance to more than 100 countries all around the world, China tries to change the narrative of a pandemic which originated in Wuhan and uh, which authorities initially, initially sought to cover up. According to uh, Kornduan, uh, COVID-19 risks are being politicized uh, to the advantage of international actors with a, in a different agenda. He said, this is the case of China, which has moved on from being the cause and the epicenter of the crisis to being perceived as a strong supporter of third countries affected by the, deeply affected by the virus. Almost a century ago, the French sociologist Marseille Mo uh, wrote an essay exploring how gifts establish status for the giver and an obligation on the part of the recipient. Now the complex relationship between munificence and self-interest is playing out at the international level. Uh, the question is uh, whether the shipment of masks across the world would compensate for that. Will mask diplomacy be effective enough to clean all the dirty hands? Um, not only China, but European Union, in order to consolidate, um, maintain its um, powerful image, called for a team spirit and secured more than $15 billion to help its partners worldwide to fight coronavirus. And also Turkey is trying to implement a generosity policy by sending masks, medical equipments, ventilators to several countries. What we're doing is also trying to repair our reputation in the international arena, which was highly eroded in the recent years under the leadership of Erdogan. And the vaccine race, and this is very important, although there are accusations of shortcuts, unethical risk taking, espionage, and etc. Russia is now leading this vaccine uh, nas nationalism. Uh, it is uh, the name of the vaccine, Sputnik V, also uh, gives us uh, the understanding and the background of this uh, political race for uh, vaccine. As you know, the launch of this satellite in 1957 it was considered as the beginning of space age but this time russia is not pushing the boundaries of the space but medical science and so this race may trigger the construction of a new era the age of biopolitics uh, faced with the COVID pandemic that paralyzed the world a vaccine is considered as the best solution for challenging the risk with a scientific weapon uh, unlike social distancing or lockdowns a vaccine will be simple, un uncontentious, and to the point solution, uh, which will help to solve not only health related, but also economic and political problems. However, uh, it, when it comes to the production and the distribution of the vaccine, it seems to create new problems. Uh, you can understand from tr the Trump, the meaning of producing a vaccine, not only a tool for international reputation, but also vital support for fueling his election. And the United States took this as a national issue and declared that it will not participate to the United Nations sponsored COVAX program as it aims to jointly develop and equally distribute a vaccine to the world. Um, due to the claim that the leader of uh, this initiative is WHO and their leader is corrupt and the, the United States government officials do not want to take part in that. And also China has approved the first use of a vaccine in the ranks of its military and they don't want to miss the chance of being the rescuer of the world. So it, 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 
it is becoming more and more political and it's going to be more political when it comes to the distribution of the vaccine. And also uh, another tactic is the success stories, artificially designed success stories. In a global battle of narratives, the governments are desperately in need of success stories. So nearly all of them are accused of underreporting the numbers. From the start of the pandemic, uh, checking in on uh, statistics, uh, checking in on statistics has become something of a daily routine for many of us. Tracking the number of cases and deaths in a spe specific country or region offers a sense of how quickly the virus is proliferating or uh, being contained. So governments have a natural inclination towards playing with the statistics. Although draconian countermeasures have been adopted in many countries, the proliferation of the uh, virus couldn't be stopped. So, but you can play with the numbers. Uh, for example, in Turkey, we are using the same strategies uh, by stating that that statistics are very low. Every Turkish citizen has complete access to medical care for free. By the way, this is true. Uh, and Turkey resumed its uh, economy earlier than any other European country. According to Financial Times, Turkey's virus deaths may be 25% higher than the official figure. But even if it, if it is so, the numbers are still very low. So, as a last word, it is a global crisis, and like all global crises, uh, although uh, are by, by a sense political, whether their context are economic, for medical, military, uh, or anything else. The outbreak of this pandemic may not be able to change the ongoing system by its own, but for sure it will accelerate the speed of the prevailing systemic change. Although the most wanted thing in the world nowadays is to get back to our normal lives and daily routines, we have to be ready for the new normal in our lives, but also in the global political atmosphere too. Here comes a graffiti uh, for you. Uh, perhaps, I mean, uh, it is from Hong Kong and we can, it says that we cannot return to normal because the normal that we had was precisely the problem. Perhaps we're not facing now, uh, we, the problem that we're facing now is not the real problem, but a shortcut solution of a bigger one. Maybe it's an opportunity to reshape the global order without using 20th century mechanism, uh, mechanisms like global wars. Uh, thank you very much. Finished.